Welcome to College of Knowledge, Learning Allies podcast for college students who are blind or visually impaired. This show brings together the three core elements of Learning Allies College Success Program. Mentors, resources, and community. I'm your co-host, Rashad Jones, lifelong musician, disability advocate, and college success mentor. We're back and we're very excited to bring you this next season. As you guys all know, this year holds a lot of unknowns, but we at College Knowledge are here to help you navigate through it. Our first episode of the season will introduce you to our program director, Mary Alexander. Mary was not available to kick off the podcast in the spring, but she has returned and jumped back into the excitement of a vibrant group of initiatives. I had the pleasure of speaking with her a few weeks ago to learn a little bit more about her and the huge role she plays in the College Success Program. Mary Alexander has worked at Learning Ally as part of outreach since 2004. And in 2014, she became the National Director of Blindness Initiatives at Learning Ally. She lives outside of Dallas, Texas with her husband and her son, Cooper, the youngest of her three children, and many animals. Cooper is also blind. Mary, welcome to College Knowledge. Thank you, Rashad. So my first question for you, Mary, is how did your life bring you to Learning Ally? So what experiences or what was it that drew you to Learning Ally? Okay, well, in 2004, um, Learning Ally was called Recording for the Blind and Dyslexic at that point. It was uh, RSB and D was a- that version of it. Yeah, you probably remember that. Mm -hmm. um, many of the students, you know, that we are uh, working with now in the College Success Program used RFB and D in, in some of the prior formats uh, other than, you know, other than download that we have now. Uh, but what brought me to RFB and D was um, my youngest son that you'd mentioned, Cooper. Mm -hmm. uh, he had been born in nine, 1995, uh, developed hydrocephalus, and then uh, had a severe um, severe reaction, I guess. When you when you have hydrocephalus, it's, it's usually because of a brain injury, and his was from meningitis. And uh, he has a cortical visual impairment, which leaves him with very little uh, usable vision and uh, cerebral palsy. So, um, you know, the the uh, prognosis on Cooper was not really all that great, and. We were always worried about, you know, his education and what, you know, parents always say, what will our, what will my kid become, you know, but um, I became very interested, though, in ways of educating uh, people who are, are visually impaired in um, how he was going to read, especially I'm an avid reader, and that always was something that I wanted to be sure he was um, able to do, so um, I wasn't sure if he would be able to read Braille successfully. Um, so I looked into other, other as it turns out, he's a, a wonderful Braille reader. So yeah. that was, yeah, <laughs> so I didn't have to worry about that. Yeah. But, um, but I knew that um, audio was something he also liked. So by the time he's in third grade, um, he'd already been listening to commercially available audiobooks. And I found out about RFB and D uh, at the same time as I found out that they were looking for someone to, to work in the school system because we had just received a big uh, state grant. And so I was one of the first um, outreach employees that they'd hired through that and got to work with some really great people in Austin um, around that grant, which we still have uh, a type of it today in place in Texas. So that's, that's a really good thing. But that's, that's what brought me here. And I worked um, in schools. I worked with um, teachers of the visually impaired. I worked with teachers who taught students with dyslexia. I learned a lot about both of those things. And so I had a really good beginning. Right. Well, I've got a follow-up question. So what, what did that work involve at that time, if you don't mind? No, it's no problem. Um, so I've always worked out of my home with RFB and D because we don't have a studio in the Dallas area. Um, but uh, the work would involve, um, because we got funding from the state, we, we needed to place, we had memberships at that point uh, for schools. And so we needed to place these memberships in schools and it was, it was basically learning and raising awareness about RFP and D and how audiobooks can help students learn. You know, it's not a crutch. It's not anything that you would use just purely for enjoyment, although you can. 
but for students, it's something that's vital, especially if they have trouble reading the printed word. So educating them about that was my primary job. And, and at that point in 2004, it was all done in person. So I would spend a lot of time in the classroom with teachers uh, developing uh, curriculum for their students to use in, in conjunction with how they were learning to read. Uh, so it really fostered a deep love in, in me about early literacy uh, for braille, writer, braille, braille readers as well as for low vision students. Because I could see that um, all of our blind students, you know, in the in the state, were getting RFB and D as as part of their IEP process uh, that they would go through. But um, many of the low vision students weren't, and that really bothered me. So, gotcha. I was on a campaign, Rashad. <laughs> well, that's great to to have such um, activism and someone who's so dedicated to um, literacy and, and and making sure that everybody has access to it. So. Um, I yeah. think that's great. Kind of leads us a little bit into our next question, which is how did you become interested in college success for students who are blind or visually impaired? Yeah, so in 2013, Learning Ally did some great research. Um, we hired an outside firm to do the research for us, but the research entailed, it was ethnographic, and it entailed following about 26 students who were blind or visually impaired, you know, possibly low vision, in um, in primarily the tri-state area, New York, Connecticut, uh, uh, New Jersey area. And um, the, the research came back. We, we actually asked them to do this research so we could figure out a better audio book, right, for the college student. Uh, we did this also in conjunction, the partnership, our partnership is with Lavelle Fund for the Blind out of New York City. They are a, uh, our primary number one partner. They have always supported us in this. And so, um, but we went into it wanting to be really open-minded. So when the, the research firm came back and they showed us their findings, really needing a better audiobook was not the top of their list. There was all of these other findings they had from uh, how students were not coming, they weren't coming out of the uh, secondary school system prepared to direct their learning as they needed to do once they hit college. As you know, Rashad, being the mentor that you are, um, you have to be able to speak for yourself in college, um, direct a whole group of people um, or system, right? And be able to communicate well, use your technology well, um, be able to get around campus if you're on campus. Uh, there's so many pieces to it. And expecting a high school student or an 18 year old to come out of high school prepared to do that um, with this, the current prep program that we have in place it just is not working. And so um, we saw that, we sat down, there were several of us in this uh, development team. Um, I had, we had a great team and uh, one of them is still with us today, uh, Kristen Watucky, who is our career person. She was also on this same team. But the other part of what brought me to this program and, and helped me to be a stronger advocate for it within Learning Ally was I had served on the board since 2009 at the Texas School for the Blind. And that's a position that, that the governor appoints you to, and it's, it's primarily a fiduciary position, but um, it helped me understand how schools for the blind uh, pre are preparing our students. And it's actually a lot different than how public schools prepare our students. Um, I think the students that come out of TSBVI are much better prepared <laughs> to um, direct their own learning, to advocate for themselves. And yeah, they're, they're so on top of it and they're so independent. And so I've tried to take what I've learned there and, and put that into the program. I, I haven't always been as successful as I'd like, but um, you know, I just think it's important to, also my son was, a, was starting college at that same point. And so, you know, some of the learnings uh, from some of the stuff that he struggled with, I've, I've tried to, to do that as well. But, um, I'm pretty proud of what we've come up with, though, Rashad. I think that uh, the mentor part of our program is probably the most important part. Not that any of the others are not important, but that connection between someone who is like you and who gives you this great advice because they've lived it. You, you really, there's no way to uh, duplicate Trust that. me, if, if, if this had been around when I was in college, I just... I think I would have been much better off, um, but we don't have time for that story. But it's certainly, I'll, I'll say this, it was certainly a struggle uh, having the perception that I was the only one 
around yeah. just doing that, being a, a blind, visually impaired person and in college and, and, and music specifically. So it, it was it was very difficult. So I know that um, in my mentorship, I always try to make sure that my mentees know that I'm available. They can reach out to me at any time and we can we can discuss what's going on and, and you know, I offer offer whatever feedback I can. But, you know, just knowing that someone else is there is something that um, I think you're right. It's priceless. I, think it's priceless. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. 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 So um, are there any principles of program design that you followed as you designed the program? So, you know, I was part of it. As I said earlier, I was part of a team on this. And I think our early principles of design I'm sure that Jeff Ho, uh, who runs our um, analytics department now, he was the head of our solutions department at that point. And um, he most likely could answer that question better than I could. But I would say the, the types of things that I, I really fought for and that Kristen and I both agreed on were, first of all, we had to design this program so that students could get the information that they needed anytime, anywhere. Um, which is why our entire program is virtual. Uh, the other principle that is, has always been of the utmost importance is accessibility. Anything we do on uh, the College Success Program, the systems that we use, um, hiring our mentors, you know, we, we constantly are questioning and pushing, are these systems, are these uh, resources, are they accessible? Are they the best accessibility they can be, or are they just kind of sort of, you know? And so I know that when we were first hiring mentors, um, our HR systems, um, you know, we, we had to change some of those. And I think that we have a much better system for it now, probably even than when you were hired, Rashad, um, but hopefully. But, um, but, you know, it's that constant pushing and questioning that in a way that is not uh, uh, seen as harping, I guess is the I want to be a good advocate, um, but I've always firmly believed that uh, there, to be a good advocate, you have to be a little pushy. And so we always, um, we always push for that in the program. And I think that you can see that in everything we do. We're designing a new website now for the program. And that is, that is the primary design focus, is it has to be easy to navigate, um, the information we want it to be of the utmost, uh, quality and, um, yeah, so those are just the things that we always, there's probably a word for that and it's not intelligent design or anything. That's not really it. But, um, <laughs> anyway, yeah. There's some term for it, there's yeah, for but it. just making sure, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So just making sure that the um, population who needs it, so the, yeah. i.e. the college students are able to get what they need in an, in a, a way that's not stressful or anything well, like and that and having easier, access to that. Yeah, help. and it's easier than any other website they've they've ever gone to. You know, I mean, the, the students we work with, they already struggle, some of them, with with, ab, with um, technology. Why would we put barriers, you know, up for them? So um, anyway, I hope, I hope that we accomplish that, especially with the new website. So um, our next question, Mary, is, what is your job like from day to day? I know earlier we talked about what your job was like when you began working for, at the time, um, recordings for the blind and dyslexic, but um, what is it like now at Learning and Life? Um, well, you know, it's interesting. What my job was like a year ago, mm -hmm. which is the same job, right, as I have, um, and what it's like today are very different because um, my job has always entailed a lot of traveling and representing the organization at conferences and um, I do a lot of public speaking um, for the you know for that type of thing uh, as well as building partnerships and, and um, agreements with both uh, state departments of uh, voc rehab uh, and foundations and so travel was always a big part of my of my job and has been ever since I started so um, in March of course that all changed and it's so my job primarily now is um, I still do the same type of partnership building and developing relationships, but it's all done on Zoom or the phone, and it's it's a lot different. But my job is as the national program director for initiatives for the blind is uh, it's primarily stewarding our programs. Right, uh, we have a, a certain budget that we that I have to 
be sure we're following. And so there's some um, uh, finance work that it has to be done every every month. Um, when you, I manage people, right? So I have several people that are on our CSP team. And um, so we have, uh, all of us have meet, group meetings once a week, but then we also have some one-on-one -on -one meetings. And um, then I, of course, report to somebody. So in any kind of job, um, you are most likely always going to report to somebody, even if you're the CEO of Learning Out. We have a board, a national board that you report to. So, so nobody, nobody's a free agent, and um, we all have goals, and um, we work really hard to be sure that that we meet those goals each year. But um, in my role, I do have to, um, as I said, you know, do a lot of outside work with external partners. Uh, but uh, I also, like right now, um, we are developing this new website. So I do a lot of work with the website developer, making sure that uh, the project plan that he shared with us is something that he's following and that we're getting the best bang for our money, right? Because we're paying for it, obviously. Uh, yeah, so that kind of thing. So it's kind of funny. When I first started, I was much more uh, of what you would consider doing hands-on stuff, right? I was working in schools. I was dealing directly with the people who were going to be using our uh, product, for lack of a better word. And now when you're at that management level <clears throat> or director level, you stop doing that direct um, stuff, which most people in my position miss. You know, having the interactions with people like our students is um, something that I've always valued a lot. But um, it's, it's, that's also one way that my board service comes in is because I have direct interaction with a lot of students that way. And I enjoy good, that. Good. I think, uh, I know for sure if, if, if our roles were reversed, I, I, I know I would be begging to get back with the students. Just that interpersonal mm -hmm. yeah. interaction and just, exactly. you know, being able to relate to them and, and help them through or, or celebrate their, their triumphs is really something that's um, important to me. So. I know that you know we we have a great leadership team at, at Learning Ally. Our CEO Andrew Friedman and our Chief Operating Officer um, Cynthia Hamburger. They're great, but let me tell you, students are a lot more. <laughs> them, so. Well, great. That's good to know. That's good to know. You kind of alluded to uh, what's in my next question, and that is, what kinds of projects are you looking forward to in the future? What's coming up next? What do you think? So with the College Success Program, um, last year we asked Lavelle to help us develop, to investigate and develop um, a program that tried to bring um, uh, the preparedness to students at a younger age. And so we are in the midst of, um, at the same time as we're doing a website, we're in the midst of uh, developing something, uh, leveraging what we already have in our program, right? Uh, for students that are still in high school. And, um, you know, teachers of the visually impaired are so busy. Um, and we know that. I mean, they, they you know, they see babies to, to 21 and uh, are dealing with students who have all types of vision loss. And um, they have to be uh, jacks of all, of all different traits, right? So um, we're trying to, to develop something that will help them right, during this transition period, which is hard, um, but also possibly something for parents, because I know being a parent, uh, that, you know, when we started talking about transition during Cooper's IEPs, it honestly, even th though I work in this field, it wasn't overly clear to me what they were trying to say, because they use a lot of jargon, and um, uh, you, at, by the time you start talking about it, you're sort of almost hardened, right, to the fact that there's all this additional stuff now that needs to be done. Well, you've done things as your child's advocate this way for so many years. Now they really want you to kind of turn and not do that anymore and let the child kind of step in. And so I think that we leave it too late, a lot of that. And um, so we're excited about that. We don't, I don't, I can't really tell you exactly what it's going to look like yet because we're not even sure. But it will be virtual, just like our other program, and because that's, that is one of our principles. But, um, I'm excited to see what it'll do. It'll honestly, um, I hope that it involves direct um, interaction with students, but with the FERPA laws that are in place uh, for K through 12, um, that may or may not be really feasible. 
So it may be more parent teacher type interactions. I don't know, but um, I'm excited. I think it'll be fun and, and I'm looking forward to it. Great, great. That's very exciting and um, encouraging to know. Um, and so finally, Mary, uh, what advice would you give to a college student who is blind or visually impaired? Um, the most important thing you can do, well, actually there's two really important things that you learn how to ask for help and that you learn it in a variety of ways and that you make yourself practice it. Um, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's basically learning how to advocate for yourself in a really positive way, right? And I think that the more you start doing it, the more, the, the stronger you'll be at it. I don't, I don't care if you're shy, if you, <laughs> it really doesn't matter. You need to do this if you, especially if you're blind or visually impaired. And then the second thing, yeah, the second thing I would do, uh, I would really highly urge uh, students is to be sure you uh, uh, work on your orientation and mobility. You know, the ability to um, navigate your surroundings is so vital. It, it keeps you from being isolated. Uh, you know, you can't depend on just a guide dog. You, you have to have all, all of those skills need to be good. You know, if you have a guide dog, that's great, but, but be sure your, your cane skills are strong still, you know, because you, of course, you shouldn't have a guide dog without having a cane in your bag, right? I mean, you need to be sure all of that is there. So um, those are the things that I see holding students back. Those two things are probably the most important um, aspect that holds, that will hold students back, both in, in college, but also in employment. So um, if, if, I, if I were asked what, what I would tell um, call, uh, job seekers that are blind, I would say the same thing, but I would also say, um, you know, just remember that as a, as a job seeker, um, you will be answering to someone else. You know, in, in, in college, you have all this great independence, right? And, and you, you probably have to answer to your parents to some ex extent. But um, college is, is opening your eyes and your mind and, and it's kind of freeing you up. When you get a job, it's exciting. And I, I want all of our students to have jobs, but um, no one owes you a job, right? You have to fight for it and you have to show your very best side and, and understand that to have that job, you're gonna have to work and, and prove why you should be able to keep it every day. That's what I do. I know it's what you do at your job. And um, for, for whatever reason, um, it is easy to, to think that people just kind of, that, that jobs come along and, you know, you should have a job just because you should. And that's, that's not the case. So. Right. You, know. you have to bring something to the table and show they, everyone else doesn't know your amazing yeah. self. So you have to prove show it to your them. Passion, like you said. Right. Yeah. Show your passion and um, uh, do something that you love. And, that, and you will never regret your job at all, if, as long as it's something that you love. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for um, sharing with us from, um, from your perspective and so that we got a little bit more insight about how the program started and just overall um, what its aims are so that people know. So thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. I'll speak with you soon. Before we go, we'd just like to thank Learning Ally staff for supporting the podcast and our funders and stakeholders for supporting all that we do. The co-hosts of College Knowledge are Brian Duarte, Rachel Greider, and Rashad Jones. Our program director is Mary Alexander. Our podcast writer is Kristen Wataki. Abigail Shaw produced the audio for the show, and Rachel Greider composed the theme song. Finally, our social media and marketing manager is Katie Otagio. I'm Rachel Greider, and this is College Knowledge.